In the New Testament, we are informed that the good Lord himself enjoys hilarity because it says the Lord loves an hilarious giver. We've got the good fortune tonight to have as our pulpit guest a man that God's given unique gifts, and he's given them back to the good Lord for his use. He's a man whose ministry is meaningful mirth, and it's a delight tonight to have him with us. Good to have any colored patch cousin from Mississippi here, Jerry, any time. I guarantee you it is. And it's a pleasure tonight to present to you, you knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior, your blood-bought, spirit-baptized, book-believing, Christ-sharing brother, Jerry Clower. Let the Holy Spirit in you greet the Spirit in Jerry Clower. I'm somewhat glad to be here with you. I'm something another glad a while of being asked to come and fellowship with you. And it's good to talk to you. I feel like I'm in a monk's my own kind. <laughs> oh! Mm. As I was sitting here on the couch or looking out at all y'all, <laughs> it's just good to see the faces of smiling Christian folk. And I can't help but think about where Brother Price and I growed up. Osaka, Mississippi is where he's from. And I was born 12 miles due west of there at Route 4 Liberty, Mississippi. <laughs> and you know, it's beautiful to think back and to see how good God is. Ain't God good? You see, it's at Amit County Fairgrounds at Route 4 Liberty, Mississippi. I remember standing there as a little old tow-headed boy, and I could smell them hamburgers cooking. And I'd cry because I couldn't have one. And the reason I couldn't have one is real simple. Some of you folks that's 50 years of age that growed up like I did, holler out and tell me why I couldn't buy me no hamburger. Tried, right, I didn't have a nickel. Now my kids can't fathom this, thank God. And I know yours can't. But I stood there, wanting a hamburger from that period of time that my home was a broken home. And I didn't have a papa from that time that strong drink busted up the home that I lived in. And me and my mom and my brother had to get out. From that time until my mother met a man named Elliot Moore and married him, and he then began to be my father. During that period of time, I'd smell them hamburgers cooking, and I couldn't buy one because I didn't have a nickel. But it's an ill wind that blows nobody good. Something good came from that because I stood there watching them chomp on them hamburgers. And I vowed before God, if I ever got in the position to have the money in my hand, and I'd smell the odor of a hamburger cooking, I'd eat me one. <laughs> and so help me God, I've been true to that vow ever since. <laughs> I have. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be true to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. And I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, wondering how he can love me, a sinner, condemned and unclean. I once was an outcast, a stranger on earth, an alien by choice and a sinner by birth. But I have been adopted and my name's written down and I'm an heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown. 
I am not a preacher. I'm a Christian entertainer. And I feel the greatest thing in my life is to witness for Christ wherever I have the opportunity to do so. My, it's good to be here to share my testimony with you. I wish I could get up on a mountaintop and the Lord would give me the strength to yell the message of salvation to each and every human being on earth. But inasmuch as I cannot do that, I want to tell you how I feel about some things. I feel each and every individual ought to go off in a quiet place occasionally and review their life. And eyeball to eyeball the Lord and explain to Him why you doing some things like you doing them. A man come up to me the other day and said, Brother Jerry, I think they ought to do this so and so and so and so and I don't like that fellow. I said, friend, you better clean that up a little bit because you're going to have to explain the exact same thing you telling me to the Lord one of these days. And unless you change what you say, and I hope I'm present, because I don't believe you're going to make out with that. So as an individual, I think we all ought to do some things. And the first thing in our review, we ought to make for sure that we are saved. Are you saved? That's the main most thing that each and every individual, as an individual, ought to review with their life. And say, am I on the road to heaven? Am I saved? I am the product of a broken home. My mother and father separated when I was a little boy due to strong drink and other sins that followed that addiction. And you know, I don't believe I'd drink beverage alcohol if I wasn't a Christian. Because I see statistical proof that one out of 11 social drinkers have a problem with it. Suppose you had a dog that statistics had proven that dog is going to bite one out of 11 people that come to your house to visit you. Now you'd get rid of that dog. I on second thought, if I could name the folks that the dog would bite. <laughs> Suppose you had a horse that you bought for your little boy. And that horse had proven by his past action that he's going to throw one out of each 11 young'uns that get on him. You'd get rid of the horse. Suppose you had 11 glasses of water here and you said one of them's poison. Would you say, I'm going to risk it? Or would you walk around the corner and get you some water that you knew didn't have no poison in it? So that's why I don't drink. Even if the Bible didn't say that if I take a social drink and I don't have no problem with it, but a fan of mine sees that Jerry Clower, the Grand Ole Opry star, is a social drinker. He'll try and have him a sip. But then that individual can't handle it and end up an alcoholic. The Bible makes it plain it's my fault. Now the Bible don't say you'll go to hell if you take a drink of whiskey. I wished it did. But I am the product of a broken home due to strong drink and other sins that follow that addiction. So my mother, my brother Sonny, and myself had to get out and move in with Big Daddy at Route 4 Liberty, Mississippi. Just around the branch from where I was born. And one hot July day, my mama told me and my brother Sonny, said, you boys quit plying a little early today. Because they're having a revival meeting over to East Fork Baptist Church and says, you boys will be interested in knowing that every fourth Sunday in July they have been having a revival meeting over at that old church since 1810. I thank God for my Christian heritage. And my mama said, y'all get ready now. Quit plying a little early today and draw you up some water. Set it out in the sun and let the sun warm it and get you a good bath. We're going to walk to church in the morning. 
Well, me and my brother Sonny went possum hunting the night before. The dogs bait a pole cat. And we got involved in that thing. <laughs> and ending up having to strip in the yard and burn our clothes <laughs> before we could come in the house. So the next morning we had to take another bath. And we draw up a bucket of water and stand there and pour that bucket of water slowly over my brother's head. And then he'd soap down while I was drawing up one. And then I'd wrench him off. Then he'd draw up one and pour it over me and I'd soak down and he'd draw up one and wrench me off. I mean, we'd done it out in the yard. <laughs> right. And even the folks that didn't have nothing referred to us as being poor. <laughs> but we got up and Drawed up to water and took a bath and put the best we had on. We walked to East Fork Baptist Church. My mama had made a chicken pie and two egg custards. And we walked over there. Heard a sermon preached that morning. Brother Pardue from the First Baptist Church of Magnolia, Mississippi was doing the preaching. And Coach C.C. C. Hotmore, a football coach, was leading the singing that week. And we got there and I heard that preacher preach. We spread our dinner out there under them oak trees and eat that chicken pie. Mama whooped me at that meeting because she caught me sneaking a tablespoon over in my overhaul pockets. A big tablespoon. I love them chicken pies and I love to hunt them gizzards in there. Oh! I could stick that tablespoon down in the crust of that chicken pie and Flip that gizzard out of there just like it was a money rod. Yeah, I could get it. Yes, sir. And then that afternoon, we heard another sermon. And that afternoon, I noticed a little blonde-headed girl walking in amongst the folks there at the revival meeting. And I thought she was the prettiest thing ever I had seen in all my life. And I started trying to wire, work it around where I could sit by her and hold her hymn book. Well, there wasn't enough hymn books to go around. I was being nice to that young lady. And I worked it around where I could hold her hymn book. And I thought she's the prettiest thing ever I had seen in all my life. And we went back every morning and every night to that revival meeting. And Thursday night of that week, the preacher got up and said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I sit back there in the back and I say to myself, Well, he ain't talking about everybody. Because you know, I know some folks that ain't no sinners. And the preacher said, I'm talking about each and every individual in the world. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Well, I eased up on the back of the pew and grabbed a hold of it. I said, now if everybody is a sinner and the wages of sin is death, then I am in a mess. (laughs) But that preacher smiled. And he said, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. And while they were singing number 197, only trust him, I hit that aisle and I walked down that aisle and I took my pastor, Brother Price Brock, by the hand And I had that experience of grace that only comes from the saving power of God. And I have been a Christian ever since while Brother Brock was dealing with me. And he had the assurance from me that I knew what I was doing. And I was a child of God. And I was gloriously saved there that night. He left me and turned to deal with another individual who had walked down the aisle following me. And I looked around. And it was that little blonde-headed girl. And we were baptized the following Sunday morning in the east prong of Amit River. And while she was walking up out of that water, I discovered again how pretty she was. And we started courting. Ah, don't you young people sit there and giggle and look at me. (laughs) And... 
get home tonight and say, ha-ha, Brother Jerry said he started courting when he's 13 years old. I did, but all my steady courting in them days was walking to and from church and in church. We didn't have no car. And I would advise all of you young people that think you ought to go steady at age 13 and you feel like you have fell in love at first sight, you back off and take another look. What you're doing is dangerous and I don't recommend it to you none. But I started courting that little blonde. I never dated another girl. I never had another sweetheart. And right now, that same blonde is the mother of my four children. And I some kind of love her. And we have a Christian home where love is. I have a 23-year-old son who's married. I have a 21-year-old daughter that's married. I have a 14-year-old daughter at home, and I have a 6-year-old baby girl that sneaked up on me and Mama. <laughs> And I want you to know that the greatest thing that ever happened to me is when I was saved. The next greatest thing that has ever happened to me is to see someone else be born into the kingdom of God. And for God to let me be saved with a young lady and have a Christian courtship and now have a Christian home. There's no blessing a man can have any greater than that. Now, I was doing a news conference not too long ago. And it was about the time that that lady, that accommodating lady in Washington, was doing her thing with those congressmen. And this fella at the news conference looked right at me, TV cameras and the newspaper reporters, and he said, Jerry... Can your secretary type? I said, fella, you ought to follow me around about a week. Come go to Yazoo City with me. Stay in my house with me a couple of days. Let me show you a Christian home where love is. And I said, you want to write about all these folks that's got all these different women folk in their life. You have referred to me at this news conference that I am a celebrity and you wrote in your paper that I'm the number one country comic in America for four years in a row and nobody's ever done that before. I said, why don't you write about my love life and tell them that I have never had my hands on another female except my wife. And I'm doing it like God said do it. And if you know of a better way, oh, you let me know about it because I couldn't stand it. I don't believe I could. I ain't here to try to straighten nobody out. About half the folks I meet have broken homes. I do not look down my pious nose at you because I am the product of a broken home. Myself. But thank God, I started working on it early. And if God gave me the ingredients and told me to make a woman, I'd make her exactly like my wife. I wouldn't change nothing about her. Oh, she inconveniences me on occasion. I drive up to the house and I can't find a parking place. <laughs> but it ain't because she's in there planning a dance for the 7th and 8th grade. Or it ain't because she's in there figuring out what kind of cocktail to serve somewhere. It's because she's in there hearing young people recite the Word of God. Because she's one of those ladies that hears young people in the Bible Memory Association. And she's thrilled to death to see big old football players come in and recite the Word of God. And the high school quarterback the other day, a godly young man, recited all the scripture you can recite. He won the top award and my wife was just elated. As an individual, the first thing I would do is make for sure that I am saved. <laughs> 
Are you saved? I just told you when I was saved. Now you might not remember the exact time like I remember the time when I was converted. Fourth Sunday in July, 1939 is when the meeting started. Thursday night of that week was July the 29th, 1939. And you might not remember the exact time that you were saved. And I don't know that that's all that important. But what is important, do you now at this minute, while you are hearing my voice, are you now saved? Do you know that you are a Christian? That's what's important. The Lord ain't interested in what you used to do. Just what you're going to do from today forward. That's all. Next, after I get saved and make for sure that I have been born again, I'd hunt up and seek out a New Testament Bible-believing church. And I'd put my membership in that church, and I'd make them a good hand. And after I got faithful to my church, there are several things that I would make up my mind that I would do. I'd even tithe my income. More people are robbing themselves of the blessing of giving than any other thing on this earth. And I know what you're thinking. I get a lot of letters. Folks see my TV show and I'll sneak in a little testimony on it occasionally. And folks will write me and say, man, it's easy for you to tithe because you make a lot of money. Well, I'm not going to lie and tell you that I don't make above average means. But I tithe my income when I was a full-time fertilizer peddler. <laughs> I'll venture to say that had I not been found faithful and been a good steward, when I made a modest salary, God wouldn't have trusted me with another dime. And some of us are not being blessed because we've never received the blessing of giving. And God can't trust us to give if he gives us anymore. But friends, there ain't nothing like it. I tithe to the First Baptist Church of Yazoo City, Mississippi. I'm a storehouse tither. And then all my other stuff is over and above that. And that's the least I can do. And as I read the Word of God and study tithing, the Lord said, if you see somebody don't have no coat, pull yours off and give it to him. Well, if he'll bless me by just being a tither of a minimum goal of 10%, that's a good deal. I thank him for that. And after I got saved and got in a New Testament Bible, believe in church and got faithful to the church and started being a cheerful giver, systematically giving every week, I wouldn't be a nitpicker. I wouldn't care what color shirt the preacher wore when he preached. Nitpicking. If you are a nitpicker, and why are you driving home after service on the Lord's Day and talking to your husband or your wife in front of your children, nitpicking about the church, let me suggest that you come down to the church office and take you one of them cards that's got a family listed of unchurched folks. Lost individuals, if you please. And you get your Bible and go ring that doorbell and go in there on them and pray with them and win them to Jesus. And the morning you see them walking down the aisle of your church, your battery will get so charged that 99 and 44, 100% of your nitpicking will be cured. Because you'll be doing what God wanted you to do. I remember there's a young man that I love very much and I used to witness to him and talk to him about the Lord. His wife was a Christian and she attended my church. And I would talk to him about the Lord and he'd say, Jerry, you Baptists ain't never going to vote on me. And so one day I just told him, I said, look, I ain't interested whether they vote on you or not. I want to somehow or another let you know that I love you. And one of these days your young ones are going to be asking you, how come you don't go to church with their mama? And we was having a revival meeting and I got a preacher friend of mine to go visit him and uh, we couldn't find him, but we caught him riding around in town. We just got in on the back seat when he stopped at a red light. <laughs> and he knows I love him. And I invited him to the meeting, and he said, Jerry, you Baptists ain't never going to vote on me. 
But that evening I was shopping at the grocery store and I heard a commotion and here he come. And tears is coming down his cheeks. He is hunting me up. He said, Jerry, I don't want to die no heathen. And I went out to the parking lot to my car. And on the way out to the car, I met a dear friend. And I said, Charles, this man is under conviction. Pray while I go deal with him and tell him about Jesus. He said, yes, I'll pray. And he just started praying. Well, what would you do, Mr. Layman? Would you have said, well, hold him right there. I'll go get the preacher. I wasn't about to rob myself of that blessing. And we got in my car and I heard him ask God to save him. That very night, he walked the aisle and publicly professed faith in Christ. I'm sitting on the second pew from the front. And when he walked down the aisle, he stopped and reached over and hugged me and thanked me. And took the preacher by the hand. And he don't know till this day whether we ever voted on him or not. <laughs> because when he got his heart right with God, he wasn't a nitpicker no more. He put first things first. And after I got saved, and after I got to be a member of a New Testament Bible-believing church, and systematically started giving a minimum goal of a tithe, attending all services that I can, being faithful to my church, not being a nitpicker, then I would never underestimate the power of Satan. He is a roaring lion seeking those whom he may devour. And be ready for it. Some of the most tragic things in my life and some of the worst disappointments I have ever had. I have seen folks' foot slip and Satan get them. And that's bad. And Satan just don't come ball face out and just say, I'm tempting you in such a big fashion. You know, if he just throws something on you real quick, uh, you can go, oh, I ain't thinking about doing that. But he does it like my grandpa used to toll them hogs. We turned the hogs out in the fall of the year after we got the sugar cane stripped and sweet potatoes banked and the corn all in the crib. We turned the hogs out. And me and my brother Sonny would worry. Oh, and you about run us crazy because our hogs was gone. We were never going to see them again. But in the spring of the year, when we'd start plowing, time to get the hogs up, Big Daddy'd fill his overhaul jumper up with the ears of corn and go down on the edge of the swamp. Peek, 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 ooh. And them old hogs would run out there and look at him. Now, if he'd have thrown a whole ear of corn down, that hog would have grabbed that ear of corn and run back in the swamp. <laughs> And just laid down and eat that corn and hid. But Big Daddy didn't do that. He done like old Satan does. He said, peek, 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 peek. And he tied shut. Tied. And he'd throw down three grains of corn. And that hog would eat that corn up and then look up. And Big Daddy'd throw down some more. Peek, 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 peek. And back all the way to the house. One step at a time, walking backwards, dropping three grains of corn. And me and my brother Sonny was up at the house building what we call a slip gap. Just a rail pin. And we'd put a stick of firewood under the bottom rail. We call that a slip gap. And when Big Daddy would toll them hogs all the way to the house, then he would empty his pockets and throw all of the corn he had left over in that pen. And when them hogs saw that whole ear of corn, they'd beeline through that hole and grab it. And when they beeline through the hole and grab the corn, wham! We had them hogs in that. And they ended up in a scalding pot of hot water before it was over with. The devil has hog pens all over this country. Some of them got pretty lights on them, flashing on and off, enticing you to come in. And he'll get you one step at a time. 
But when he gets you in there and kicks that chalk out, wham! You may end up in a pot of scalding water. Do not ever underestimate the power of Satan. But if you do and your foot slips, you know where you ought to wind up? Right here in the middle of the church house. And tell everybody, I got a burden, y'all pray for me. I got a dear friend. Went through a divorce. It embarrassed her so much she was too embarrassed to go back to church. And I talked to her. I said, look, whoo, if my foot slips or I have some burdens, I want to get out there in the middle of the church house and let them Christian folk what love me get around me and help me bear my burden. That's what it's all about. And don't sneak off by yourself and hide when you have a burden. Get all your Christian friends to help you bear it. That's what God said. Do not ever underestimate the power of Satan. And next... If I claimed to be saved and I was a New Testament Christian and tragedy hit my life, I wouldn't react to that tragedy like a pagan. I'd act like a Christian. And I believe if you took a poll of pastors all over this country and you asked them what is the most disappointing thing you have ever gone through in your pastorate, they would say most of them. I thought brother so-and-so was a staunch Christian, but a little rain fell in his life and he went all to pieces. Are you a Christian? Well, act like it. Let me be personal with you just for a moment. One Friday night before Mother's Day, just a few years ago, my phone rang. My little kitty was three weeks old. And my daughter Amy answered the phone and walked into my bedroom and said, Dad, it's some woman on the phone. It's near about midnight. I said, well, darling, she may have the wrong number. And I went and answered the phone, and this lady said hello and gave me her name, and by her very name, I knew it was a very prominent family in Yazoo County. She said, Mr. Clower, my daughter has had a spend-the-night party out here tonight. About 20 girls from Yazoo City are out here, and your son and two more boys came out visiting earlier. Your son got up and announced that he was required to be home by 12 o'clock. And the boys just left here, but at the foot of the hill there's some construction going on. And they missed their turn and we've had a bad wreck. Now the two boys on the front seat are all right. But the two boys on the back seat, one is cut up very badly. And your son, Mr. Clower, I'm so sorry, but we can't wake him up. And I said, well, lady, let me get my clothes on and I'll be out there immediately. I said, thank you for calling. And she said, Mr. Clow, I'm so sorry, but we can't wake him up. Well, I started driving out to the scene of the wreck, a full moon, and I started praying. And I said, Lord, I have gone all over this country popping off about what I'd do if tragedy hit my life. And I want you to know I have believed every word I have ever said. And Lord, if you want to throw me in the fire, you throw me in there. Because you're powerful enough to use this to your glory. And when I get out there, if my boy is alive, I'm going to praise your holy name. Or if my boy is dead, I'm going to praise your holy name. Now Lord, it's going to be hard to do. But you ain't never made a mistake. You're not going to make one with me. So whatever you do, Lord, I'll praise your holy name. To God be the glory. Great things you have done. But Lord, through it all, let me react like a Christian because I want to set an example here for other Christians to follow if lack like tragedy hits their life. Please, Lord, let thy will be done in my life. And I drove out there and they had put him in an ambulance and the ambulance was speeding off when I drove up. And I thanked them for calling me and looking out after my boy and I got back to the hospital. That was my next door neighbor standing over him with my doctor. Teenagers was lined sitting on the floor from one end of the hall to the other one sitting on the floor, some praying, some crying. And my doctor said, Jerry, I don't know how this happened, but your boy's got a soft spot right on top of his head. 
Ain't a blemish on him except that. And we're just going to have to watch him. I don't know what's going to happen. Next morning, the doctor said that he hadn't made any progress and said, Jerry, you're going to have to take him to a brain specialist at Jackson, Mississippi. Well, all the time, me and Mama praying, Lord, whatever you want done, do it. And I was also telling the Lord that I knew there's a lot of things worse than dying. And to God be the glory, great things you've done. And we put him in that ambulance, and that wasn't no ride that I enjoyed. And as we go down Grand Avenue in Yazoo City, Mississippi, I see some of my friends stopping on the street and start praying for Jerry. Man, ain't God good? Ain't it wonderful to be a Christian and you got Christian folks that'll pray for you? My soul, I feel the prayers of my friends. There's share groups all over this country that pray for me. And I'm so glad they are because there is no test of a Christian like prosperity. Don't you ever think there's any test any greater than that. We got on down to the Baptist hospital and for three days and three nights my boy didn't breathe a conscience breath. And we'd go in there every five minutes on the hour. Some of you think you got problems, you ought to go to the intensive care ward at a local hospital tomorrow. And I'll show you some problems. You think you got some. And after the third day, that doctor said, get Ray Clower out of here and feed him. He's going to be all right. And Ray Clower made all state in football after that accident, so he is all right. I would never, ever, if I were a Christian, react in any way but a Christian if I possibly could help it. Pray that if tragedy hits your life, you'll react like a Christian, not like a pagan. At the end of each and every football season, those coaches who have had a year that wasn't too good, as they go to making the circuit around talking to the supporters of the school, they'll all invariably say, we've got to get back to fundamentals. We've got to get back to basics. we just got to start out next spring teaching them how to block and tackle better. Well, anybody with half sense knows that a team that blocks and tackles the best usually wins. So I would say to you as a Christian, inasmuch as we have reviewed now, that we have had a review of our life and we have made sure that we are saved, we are in a New Testament Bible-believing church, we are faithful to that church by tithing our income, by attending its services, by praying for our preacher, by generally supporting God's program within that church to the best of our ability and I can't conceive of a Christian not going to church and after we have also decided that we will never underestimate the power of Satan and if tragedy hits our life we won't react like no pagan we'll react like a Christian so let me in closing tell you let's get back to basics and that's praying and winning lost souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. The most basic thing that a Christian is engaged in is witnessing and sharing his faith. So it is most important that you are saved because the main part of witnessing is to tell others what has happened to you. And if you're going to tell someone else how to be saved by explaining to them when you are saved, then unless you're saved, you are in a mess. Because you can't no more tell a fella how to become a Christian if you're not a Christian. No more than you can tell a fella how to get back from a place that you ain't never been to. So I would urge each and every one of us, let's get back to basics. And that basic is praying and witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Telling others about Jesus. My, what a difference Jesus makes. Every day of my life, I am tempted. And I have been able to overcome that temptation because of the difference Jesus Christ makes in my life. Not too long ago, my son was playing high school football. He was the place kicker. He kicked an extra point or attempted an extra point. And it went off to the side. It was raining. And a man down in front of me jumped up and said, You knucklehead, can't you even kick an extra point? And we had him 27 to nothing right then. <laughs> 
And the minute he said, you knucklehead, and my young'un was the one he was hollering at. I felt my wife's hand come over on my leg, and she said, that's all right, honey. That's okay, Jerry. Everything's fine, darling. But I got up, and I walked down there. And I said, sir, why did you call my young'un a knucklehead? <laughs> and you know what he said? If he'd have kicked the extra points, I would have won my bet. I'm given so many points. I said, fella, it's bad enough to bet on a horse or a dog. But when you bet on flesh and blood human beings, don't you bet on my young'un. And because you ain't going to win some money in a bet, you call my boy a knucklehead. I said, but I want you to leave this stadium knowing one thing. I'm a Christian. And Jesus Christ has made a difference in my life to the extent that I ain't going to whoop you. <laughs> But I said, everywhere you go, you tell everybody you see, Jerry Clow would whoop me, but Jesus Christ made a difference in his life and he didn't. And I said, sir, I ain't gonna lie to you, I am tempted to reach and get you in your Adam's apple. <laughs> and not only whoop you, but drag you around that track down there. <laughs> but I'm not gonna do it and I praise God for the fact that I am a Christian and his grace is sufficient to keep me from making a fool out of myself. The difference Jesus makes. Well, inasmuch as Jesus Christ makes this great difference, let's try to get Jesus preached to each and every lost individual on earth. Are you a Christian? Has God ever saved you? If not, wouldn't you just please pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I would like to put my trust in Him now and ask Him to forgive me of my sins. And I want to become a Christian and follow Him. And then get back to the basics of being a Christian and get it on. Are you saved? Are you a Christian? If not, we're going to give you an opportunity to make a decision tonight. And if you are here and there's some other type of decision you feel like you want to make, any way this church would let you make a decision, we would want you to come and make it. Your letter may be somewhere, somewhere else. It may be off uh, at the old home church where you grew up. I was visiting the other day and a man said, Jerry, I'd bring my letter to your church, but I'm out there in the country and mama still lives there and it may hurt their feelings if I took my letter out of that church. I said, fella, they want to get rid of you so bad they can't stand it. <laughs> and they just love you too much to look you in the eye and tell you, why don't you get your name off of our roll? Because every time we make a report, we got to say uh, members that don't come. I'm about the only renegade in my church. I make a motion every now and then. Them folks that don't come, we take your name off. That's right. You know, I believe in once saved, always saved. And if a fella can't get unsaved, or get his name off the roll if he don't come. If you ain't there, you ain't nothing. Why, well, last Easter, I had the privilege of being home. And I'm driving to church with my family. And I tell my wife, I said, darling... If there's a lost man sitting in the pew where I usually sit this morning on Easter Sunday, I'll kneel down there by him and pray or stand outside in the rain. He can have my seat. But if a Baptist is in my seat that ain't been there <laughs> since last Easter, he's getting up. <laughs> Yeah.
She said, honey, what in the world are the children going to think hearing you talk that way? I said, I'm saying it in front of the children because if they got a like situation, I want them to get them out of their seat too. <laughs> and you know, I say that facetiously. But I have to pray about things like that. I really do. I can't conceive of a man claiming to be a Christian that don't ever come to church. Right now, we're going to give an invitation. We'd like for you to come and turn your life over to Jesus and become a Christian or bring your letter or by statement or rededication. Number 240, just as I am. Number 24, let's all stand. Christians pray. Just give us a chord, please. And let's just go. Let's go.